And Gray, once you start, can you just announce the uh, the I, I participants that are consultants? Oh, <laughs> I have started. So why don't we? Uh, All right. So <laughs> call the meeting to... order at six oh two. Why don't we? Why don't and... you? Do, why don't you do a roll call, and we can go through, and then also go through our guests. Okay. So, um, Mike, Nottington. I'm here. All right, Jane. With that. Here. Rena. Here. Deb Loomer. Here. She Wait. raised her hand. She's here. Uh, Renee. Here. Bill. Here. David. Here. Steve. Here. Uh, and I see that Brian Beck, the superintendent Gil Montague is on, and I see Joanne Blyer is on, the business administrator or business director. And you want to uh, announce the guests, uh, Steve? Steve's, uh, Steve's muted right now. So um, from the Mars group, Steve Hemmons here. My name is Jay Barry. We've met before, Mac Reed and Paul Gagliaducci. And Alan, I won't take your phone. Okay. You didn't call my name, but Greg's here too. Oh, and Greg, <laughs> and and uh, is is Mark going to join us, uh, um, Jay? Yeah, he is. Um, as long as you're bringing that up, though, Alan, I want to kind of let you know that as a group, we've uh, we've got to stop at around seven. Okay, we so have to stop be... for seven fifteen. So that's close enough. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Now your name comes up, John Barry. I know. Yeah, that is my real name, but I go by Jay. Oh, I didn't know that. All these years working with you. <laughs> yeah, if I, get, if I get a speeding ticket, it's John Barry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to, uh, uh, you want to, uh, Greg, just make the announcements, postings and stuff? Okay, well, this is uh, November 5th meeting at 6 o'clock. And this is being videotaped. All right. And so the consultants were sent out a, uh, a list of questions that came from the subcommittees. And I think, um, I don't know, uh, Jay, you were the one talking at first, so I don't know who's going to take the lead there. But do you have that document in front of you where we can just go right down to the cover letter where it said greetings and then there's questions? Do you want me to read the question? No, well, well, you can do that if you want. One one option would be that Mac put a list together uh, of the questions from both subcommittees. And I don't know if you could allow him to share that. I'm going to be working from a printed version of that document. And Steve and I are going to be the primary voices on this. And then Mac and Paul are going to chime in when they, and Mark, when it's necessary. All right. Okay. Did, 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 um, Here's my question. Did you just cut and paste the questions that I had sent to um, in the cover letter? Yes. Did you do we, that? Yes, we did, but we kind of, we shortened them a little bit so that we could just make a quick list of them. But we have okay. them all. Hey, Mac, I will, Go for uh, it. Mac, I'll make you the host so that you can share your document. Okay. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I do not see that I can share my screen yet. Oh, yes, I do. Sorry. Um, Alan, you need to say Mark just got on. He has a heart. He has to leave at seven. Am I correct, Mark? Yeah. I don't see him. Oh, there he is. Hi, Mark. Hey, guys. I can only see Please. the very top of... I can only see the very top of your head, Mark. I don't know if you want to change your, your uh... How's that? there we go. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, well, first, we want to thank you for doing a yeoman's job of going through the report and coming up with questions. Okay. It was thoroughly read and appreciated. I can tell you that. Good. All right, so we're waiting, I think, for Mac to share something or no? Yes, yeah, I'm, uh, all right. This is a little and, bit- And Greg, different. are you, 
Greg, are you going to be able to uh, have the report available as we go through, or no? Can you can you see this? Yes. Yes. Very yeah. nice. Okay. Do you want to uh, start rolling through this, Alan? Yes, please. Okay. So the uh, education subcommittee questions are at the top of the list. And um, I'm just going to, frankly, go through this pretty quickly. It might be better if there are comments and stuff to wait until the end so that we're sure that Mark has time to speak to the financial issues. So this first one about... Um, who was interviewed at the Did school? Did you actually? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Make sure that you, you read the questions or how are you going to frame it so that anyone hearing the recording knows exactly what you're answering, okay? Okay, yeah. Uh, who was interviewed at each of the schools? Not necessarily looking for specifics, but administrators, staff, teachers, etc. So there's a list of this on page 23, okay? And uh, people can refer to that. The second question, clarify the statement about ambivalence toward the merger. Were there specific statements made and by whom? Just a general feeling based on lack of cooperation, question mark. So, um, you know, again, the administrative people uh, that we talked to were listed. And in the course of those conversations, there was not a lot of enthusiasm about the merger. The purpose of the interviews was really to talk about their programs um, but at the end of the interviews, we asked them about, about the merger. And um, there was, I think this is an accurate statement, there was ambivalence. There were some comments about some advantages to um, coordination of special ed, um, coordination of curriculum. It wasn't like it was all negative, um, but there, we did not detect a lot of uh, enthusiasm. We don't want to get into who said what here, but that was the general tone. Um, and it varied. Some people were a little more positive. Some people may be a little bit more uh, ambivalent. Um, so to be clear, that was the administrative staff or team that you yes, that, mostly uh, pr you drew. right principals, special okay. directors, etc. Um, okay. Number Thank three, you. do they know the capacity of the theater auditorium Pioneer? Um, it was mentioned specifically regarding the general uh, the Kilmonegi Auditorium. So we did go back and find that the Pioneer capacity was 400. We'd have to go back and talk to the Gil Montague folks about the Turner's Falls Auditorium. We don't have that for And I did, I did, Jay, that today called and they told me it's 410. Okay, thank you, Steve. So then starting with the Finance Committee, subcommittee questions. Um, the first one is David Stein's question by coming that he wants to discuss the lack of cost savings. So, we sort of interpreted that as a question, even though it's a comment. And just wanted to mention that when we spoke to the superintendent and our initial conversations with the planning board, cost savings were not front and center. It was about um, developing a program description for a merged district that to a large degree uh, had a substantive educational program. So. If there were savings, great, try to document them. But one of the important goals was to provide or try to provide a, sub, a description of a substantive educational program. And then I think you can see, this makes a note that on page 44, there's some potential savings combining central offices. And on page 42, uh, there's some scenarios with $250,000 of savings with option one which is I believe program one is what that refers to. Um, the second uh, point here, uh, the report indicated no co similar comment, but we could have more benefits. The report sounded like it was a way to bail out one school district, see the question surrounding whole harmless. So this, we didn't really know how to interpret this as a question. Um, the, um, there is, I mean, there. The, I can understand where perhaps there's an observation that one district benefits more than another. Um, I think there are some cost savings listed in the report. I don't know if Steve wants to make a comment about the hold harmless. That is an important issue. Well, that would be, <clears throat> Mark can also comment on it, but the fact that uh, 
Pioneers and Whole Harmless, and right now, uh, Gil Montague is Foundation Aid. And if you combine, uh, we're not sure yet, we've asked the question, we can't get an answer, that would you go back to, um, you would not get that whole harmless aid, and then you would not be, as a new district, you would not be, you don't, would not be a foundation uh, aid community. I'll let Mark talk more, but there's a real issue on the state level about whole harmless altogether, whether they're going to continue with that or not. And it's not just affecting you, it would affect a lot of school districts in the state without that whole harmless. That is, whatever you got, Chapter 70, year before you get that plus minimum aid, even if your enrollment goes down. I'd also comment on the fact that one district bail out the other. Both districts have issues. One is what we were dealing with uh, Superintendent Sullivan. One of the big things was the declining enrollment in Gil Montague, and then obviously there's some of the financial issues that Pioneer had faced. So again, they would help issues that both have uh, into the future in its sustainability that we were uh, concerned about in our reports. Mark, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Um, I do. Um, yes. So. 18 months ago, two years ago-ish, uh, we wrote the first phase one report for you or for Gil Montague Pioneer at the time, Heart, Heart Committee. And we raised this issue, uh, but the issue wasn't at over 500,000, it was roughly 207, somewhere around there. Um, I spent over an hour with Rob Hanna today discussing this very issue. And this was the first time he had heard of it. And we went over the numbers and went over the logic and he agreed with the logic. I asked him specifically if this has ever occurred before. Is there a precedent before? And to his knowledge, no. Now, he's one person in Desi. He's not Jay Sullivan. He's not Rob O'Donnell, but he works with Rob O'Donnell. Uh, they now clearly understand the issue. Uh, with respect to Hold Harmless, uh, and I know Greg and I spent some time discussing the October 16th uh, deadline for comments to DESE on Chapter 70. Um, Hold Harmless was not an issue for that discussion, for that input. Uh, but Rob did say to me there was a lot of feedback on Hold Harmless, and therefore Desi may, may look into that as part of this um, October 16th analysis. That focus was on local contributions. So in short, by combining the two regions, it appears that the two regions would lose $500,000 plus on an annual basis uh, due to the way, uh, because of Pioneer Valley's excess of base aid over foundation aid. Um, so now at least one person at DESE understands the issue and hopefully can discuss that with people like Rob O'Donnell, Jay Sullivan and others. Okay, so um, the third, uh, number three there. Jay. Yeah. Okay, Jay, before you go there, um, Mark, did you get a sense when you were talking to them that they were still encouraging or optimistic or, or you know, would like to see if this was going to happen? Um, you know, they could, they would uh, try to do whatever they could to make it um, worthwhile financially. Did you get a sense that they were interested in and in having a at least one uh just a, one uh prototype to be able to point to to see how this works well uh, rob hannah did say to me that this is the first time this issue has been raised even though we wrote about it 18 months ago uh, <laughs> i got no yeah. sense of it because now we have two conflicting policies if you will um to encourage regionalization, to not, to not subtract state aid for two regions right. or two entities that want to regionalize, that doesn't seem consistent with DESE's objectives for regionalization. So that's where it stands. The good news is they now understand it. 
it may have taken two reports for them to understand it. So now we, we can hopefully go from there. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, on number three, um, Mike indicated we have three areas of questions, individual items in the report that aren't clear or an interest in knowing more about where items come from or items that you disagree with. Completely understandable given the kind of report this is. Letter B is the, the real question here. And what we wanted to say about the assumptions is that, um, let me get my copy up here, is that the, um, is that we, we didn't, what we did with assumption, we tried to make this clear in the report, um, is that we had to rely on our experience, on documentation, um, and on financial realities, if I can put it that way, to put together a model for the high school and a model for the, for the, for the middle school, um, keeping in mind that we were asked to consider robust programming um, and uh, you know, that there was an interest in making this better than the status quo. So that's what went into this. Um, I don't wanna go on about our backgrounds forever, but you know, for example, I was a middle school principal for nine years. So Paul was a high school person. So was I for a while. Mac has a lot of middle school experience. So we relied on that kind of experience to put together team structures and ideas for what the programs would look like. And they are estimates and they're based on those kinds of assumptions. And I can understand where people might say, you know, that's not a solid assumption, uh, but that's what we had to go on. What is the report telling us and how do we want to react to it? This is- uh, Can I just idea. hop in here quickly? Yeah, sure. Sorry, just Jay, just because I'm the one who raised that issue and, and uh, Thank you for that explanation, and and I don't question your experience, but I noticed in the report um, wh what I was getting at was there seemed to be a general assumption that combining regions was clearly a good idea, uh -huh. and that the the report seemed aimed at describing how that was true. And we as a board are charged with deciding whether it's a good idea. I see. So without challenging your experience, I was just struck by the report seemed to be saying, well, yeah, this is the way to go. Right. And, and I thought it was worth for us as a board to discuss, well, do, you know, where is that coming from and do we agree with it? So sure. that's where I was coming from. Yeah, the, um, you know, again, we were asked to put the program model together, but I understand your point, Mike, because in the summary statements and some of the stuff at the end of the report, it, it does read like we're promoting it. And um, so I understand that. And you're not there yet as the planning board. You wanna know whether you wanna promote it. So good point. Um, number four. Jay, can I just add in? Yeah. Jay and I had a lot of discussion on this because he and I work on the high school, middle school programs together. Um, and I think one of the themes that kept coming up was what if nothing happens? And so that sort of always snuck into our, our work, I think, that if, if nothing changes, what's the, what's the length of time of sustainability in terms of both schools? So yeah. I just wanted to mention that as well. But again, right. that's to so, Mike's point, it's a, that's an endpoint consideration. So I, you know, I think I understand that. I can't scroll down, so let me let me just ask this question here because you it might it might have been embedded in, in what you're talking about now. The the um, education uh, the uh, finance committee was talking about they were trying to find I think the Nesdaq report to or, or what went into that because you were talking about declining enrollment and if I recall, Mike, um, you had you know, we had questions about where's the data or where what's behind that and I didn't know is that was that part of this question, Mike? Um, that, that was a question. I, I'm not sure it was necessarily part of this question. Um, I, I think I figured out where the NESDIC data is coming from. Um, okay. I, I will, what, what maybe is relevant here is uh, that the report states that NESDIC's projection for Gilmontiu is, is that enrollment will stay basically flat 
for the next few years. So whereas the report states in other places that both districts are facing declining enrollment. Huh. And since given especially the Student Opportunity Act, I mean, you know, again, the report states and we all know, uh, we don't know what the future holds, especially with, with this COVID situation. Um, but, uh, you know, right now, Gil Montague, this, this this year, Gil Montague received substantially more Chapter 78 than it has in the past. If its enrollment does not continue to decline uh, and the Student Opportunity Act continues to be implemented, that should hold true for the future. So in that sense, Gil Montague's future looks better at this point than it did at the end of the previous report. Uh -huh. And, and I'm not, it wasn't clear to me that the later, this current report really recognized that. It mentioned it in a couple of places, but then it kind of fell back on the, well, we got districts that aren't getting any chapter 78 and have declining enrollment and that's not sustainable. And I certainly agree with that statement. I just wonder whether Gil Montague still fits that model. Okay. And, and with Brian and Joanne here, uh, I, I'm really curious to hear what they say not necessarily tonight because we don't have a lot of time, but at some point, I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on this. So the, um, the next point um, was about, uh, David added that he thought that the Gilmonia superintendent may have suggested we wanted more room for those programs to end the death by a thousand cuts in parentheses. And that, that is, a, my take on that is that's a relatively accurate statement. Michael wanted us, uh, as I've said before earlier, um, to think about a robust program. Number five was Mike had a question, page 25, paragraph two, most people were ambivalent. Does this apply to just SPED or the whole process? How many people, who are they, were the consultants talking to? Not just SPED, but all areas. So again, I talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, we talked, we listed who we talked to. Um, the interviews were were not enthusiastic, um, and uh, but they weren't. Again, they weren't focused on how enthusiastic people were about a potential merger. They were about uh, the pros and cons of um, working together with a district and what might be accomplished. I, I guess I would also add that in this conversation, a lot of people it was coming to them as a very new thing. So I would add that. Um, I don't know what B means, how relative were the comments. C, talk to us about their process. So, okay, so um, again, I touched on this before, but we used, because of the pandemic, um, we um, were limited with face-to-face -face meetings. So we did have face-to-face -face meetings with both administrations. Um, we had remote meetings with the people listed on page 23. Um, we had remote meetings with you folks. We had documents from the district, um, some follow-up conversations with um, Superintendent Sullivan, and we did site visits. Um, so that was the background we used um, to generate a report that was cut short by the timeline imposed by the state and also limited by the virus we're all living with. Um, the uh, number six on page 31, the discussion is about the middle school. Well, okay, so I'm sorry if this wasn't clear to people, but this is a structure that a lot of middle schools use when their number of kids in one grade doesn't exactly match the number of kids that one team of teachers can service. So you have half teams. So that's why it looks like they're not balanced, but they are. So there's one full team in each grade. And then there's a third team that does half the kids in one grade who are remaining and half the kids in the other grade that are remaining. So that's what half team means. And I worked with middle school half teams for a dozen, half a dozen years. And it's a way that schools use to keep the team structure in place and keep the monitoring um, and curriculum coordination in place. Um, when you don't have numbers that match up exactly the way you want. Um, number seven, general question about the whole section. Is this program two? They seem to like program two. 
where did the staffing recommendations come from? So again, we relied, Mike, on the um, on what we thought was a solid middle school program and the kind of staff that it would need. Uh, class size was something Paul and I talked about a lot. So how many teachers would we need in core academic subjects? Um, we talked a lot about special ed, what kind of support were they gonna need? Um, there's some items in there relative to um, team um, chairpersons for special ed to help with coordination and the support people like um, adjustment counselors and some of the specialized um, substantially separate staff that, that uh, all schools need these days. So that's how we tried to put it together. Um, on number eight here, quick Jane question. asked. Jay, John, Jay, quick question yep. for you. Yep. Um, um, part of my question was just this section on page 30 uh, is titled recommended program description and elsewhere in the report you describe a program one and a program two right and at one point you do say that you believe program two is the preferred option but it just wasn't this isn't identified as being either one of those and so i wonder is it intended to be program two or is it some third option no we didn't I, my answer to that, Mike, is that we didn't want to make a clear recommendation about what program option or number um, to recommend. What we wanted to do is put two different options out there for consideration and show that uh, one program looked this way when you staff it and had some potential savings. The other program looked a little more substantial with staff and cost more. Um, so it depends on resources and what people think is a good match with community sentiment. Um, but I'm sorry. You are making certain recommendations uh, on page 30 and, and the next um, couple of pages. Uh, you know, I mean, one, you know, one principal, one assistant principal, one dean. I mean, those are, I guess I'm not. I'm just not quite sure how that, how this section fits into the program one, program two choice structure. Okay, I don't, I can't call up the report is, is that, right now. So I, I it's, it's, I'm having, I'm, ha I, I don't know if I can give you a great answer because I can't call up the report on my screen okay. right now. Well, I don't mean to. I mean, I know we don't. Craig, have were you able to do that? Craig, were you able to do that? Uh, I can't right now because I'm I'm not the host of the meeting. So, but if you know, okay. um, give Mike, give me the page right. number, and I will try to get back to you. Well, it, be it it begins on page thirty, and it goes on to thirty one and thirty two. Okay, I'll take a look at it. Part of what had to happen, Mike, is they came up with what the high school, middle school would look like, and in order then for Mark to go through a projection to come with you had a combined a new a new region yeah you had to have those numbers built into the budget so that's where we're trying to put in what would those needs be in order to have a new six town region and what would the administration and mark had to go through and do all of those things maybe you could comment further on that but in order to come up with projections on a new six town region you got to put in uh, not only your programs but you got to put your administration and your support staff mark you want to comment um And one from there. Okay. Well, I guess I'm just. I mean, all I'm saying is that is that it, other you know the rest of the report, other places in the report anyway, present two program alternatives, program one and program two, that require different staffing levels and have different uh, assumed costs, and this section doesn't refer to either one of those programs. So. Okay. I'll have to look I, at I'm not just, sure I don't have it in front of me, uh, Jay and Mike, but right. trying, so to follow, anyway, that was trying my... to follow it through. The, there was a difference in taking a look at the uh, administration of the school versus taking a well, look it's, at the... It also mentions world languages, music, core academic program. I mean, I think if you, if you, if you don't have it in front of you, we can follow up later. I don't mind doing sure. that. 
Yeah, okay. I'm just trying to explain what the question was, which is, is this describing program two or is it describing program one or is it describing something else? Okay. If there's administration involved. I don't no, think it's, it's not. It's I don't about, think it involves no. one or two. No, it's about, well, it's, it's, not, it's got both. It's definitely not about a third option, Mike. It's either about program okay. one or two, but I'll, I, okay. I'll try to clarify that for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I think I was at this, yeah, uh, number eight, Jane asked for clarification, SPED director, SPED chair. How did the consultants arrive at this chart, including the salary? So um, again, um, we relied on what the salary structure was uh, for the superintendent, the business manager, how much a SPED director should probably make in a district of approximately 1,600 kids, um, and that it would require the district that size would require the assistance of a of a team leader, a chairperson. Um, so we estimated the salaries. That's what we did. Um, and the team chair is a 1.5 FTE. So we're assuming that once people got into the planning process of really putting the schools together, they'd carve up that FTE in a way that made sense. But we thought the FTE was adequate for the secondary level. Um, number nine, local required contributions chart. So this I think is something that Mark and Steve are gonna comment on. Is it, is it also uh, Franklin County Tech School, I think is what that refers to. Yeah. So for ease, my comments are in blue. So this chart is the townwide local contributions. And that would include the, then the townwide local contributions is allocated to the districts to which the member town belongs. And so the townwide contribution is calculated first under chapter 70. And then the allocations are made to the districts and that's how you get each town's contribution to the region. Mark, do both districts um, do a five-year uh, rolling average to uh, proportion that out to the districts, or is that is the method the same from each in each district and mm -hmm. how they send that out for the? Towns? I don't. I, I don't remember. It was based on enrollment, but I can't remember if it was um, a five-year average. It is not. Okay. Was, I don't, Gil Monaghan does not use a five-year average. No. Well, this, is required, I don't think. this is required local contribution. The state determines this at the district. And then that goes into the assessments. Right. <coughs> okay. Yeah. I okay. think we're right. And then my, my question was around, and then the, the Joanne, and then the regional agreement, um, doesn't that then uh, talk about how that then goes to the towns? Right. The above minimum transportation assessment, capital yes. assessments are all in the regional agreement, right. and they are different right. between Gilmanio and Pioneer. All right. Thank you. All okay. right. On number 10, page 61. The question is, Northfield appropriation is cited, but did not cite Bernardson's appropriation and Montague has a similar fund. So I've addressed each town. So when the townwide contribution is then allocated to the regions, Bernardson is only allocated between Pioneer and Franklin County. Uh, Montague is the same. Northfield has one student that I believe is a non-resident student going to a different region. And therefore Northfield is gonna have about $10,100 or $10,900 allocated to Northfield, whereas the other three towns don't have that situation. They have one student who is attending Smith Bowtech. There you go. Um, I Thank tried you. to get the school to which that student was attending, but Desi would not let me have that information. 
Right. It, so it's not Northfield Elementary District. Well, in the in the allocation, it goes to Northfield, but that child goes to um, what did you say, uh, Northampton? Smith Votech. Yeah. Smith, Smith Vocational. Yeah. Okay. Uh, number eleven, page sixty nine. What is the data source for these charts? So chart 34 is from DESI. They actually filled that, uh, that's the, the data coming off the DESI website. Chart 35 is from the districts. Pa um, page 71, the last paragraph, the amounts differ from the amounts discussed on page 74. Uh, and specifically chart 38 versus the last paragraph on page 74. So chart 30, 38 is the Student Opportunities Act combined simulation run by DESE for Gil Montague separately and Pioneer separately, not the combined region. And page 74 is DESE's run of Student Opportunities Act for the combined region. So chart 38 precedes page 74 and chart 38 is individual. So if Gil Montague continued for the next six years, five years, uh, what would their numbers look like with Student Opportunities Act? And what would Pioneer look like separate from a six town region. 74 is the combined six town region. Uh, many questions regarding these charts, source and explanations. Again, it's the Student Opportunities Act simulation run by DESE. And we spent some time with both Rob Hanna and Rob O'Donnell on those numbers. Uh, number 14. Where, where, where are you? Oh, uh, number 13? That was 13. Number 14, hold harmless aid to Pioneer Valley and Student Opportunities Act aid to Gil Montague. Uh, Mark, can I just ask a quick sure. question on that 13? Um, did you give us um, the source documents for those charts? So I, I stand to be corrected, but that is Appendix 11. And Appendix 11 is a workbook with about five or six tabs documenting that. Thank you. That was a missing piece. Thank you. Yeah, well, okay. I guess um, maybe I can follow up. Not find everything I. Thought I might find it. Will the state? We don't need to see. I'm sorry. We don't need to spend a lot of time now going over okay. it. But uh, will the state continue the student opportunities aid to a combined district? And the short answer is yes. Is there a process for securing the higher aid amount? And my answer there is not that we know of. And that, if you recall my earlier discussion of my discussion with DESE today. C, do we know if the combined district numbers would qualify or not qualify for the student opportunities criteria? So un understand this, every district has a run on the Student Opportunities Act. The Student Opportunities Act is gonna put more money into the foundation budget in certain areas. That, in theory, is going to increase your foundation budget. And then the foundation aid is calculated from the foundation budget less the required district contribution. So if that foundation aid increases sufficiently to be greater than the base aid, then you're going to get more Chapter 78 distribution. And so in the combined region, the 1.5 million of excess base aid pioneer over the base aid absorbs 
all the benefits from the Gil Montague. And so it's a circular thing. The benefits are there, but if you get more base aid than foundation aid, then it's not going to show up until such time as that excess base aid is reduced. And again, to repeat what I said earlier, now Dissy understands your dilemma and hopefully they can act on that, but no guarantees there. Is rural aid into that as well? Rural aid is not into that. And that's okay. a question that comes up later, but I'll answer that now. Um, we left rural aid out. Rural aid is like a bonus. And we left it out because A, Pioneer Valley did not budget rural aid. And B, there's no guarantee that rural aid is going to continue. All right, uh, 15, 77 and 78. I, I guess those are charts 77 and 78. Program summaries for program one and two. How did you arrive at these? Where are they from? So if you go back to chart four on page 29, you'll see program one for the, uh, you'll see the programs for the middle school. And if you go to chart 11 on page 42, you'll see the the programs for the high school. Uh, where did the data on these two pages come from? Jay, you wanna answer that? Well, I think I've already spoken to that. We've okay. we used salary information and we used best estimates to try to peg um, what um, salary costs would be uh, for different parts of the program. Okay. Uh, Steve, number 16. Um, I'm we did not put in about uh, uh, Pioneer has a loan to pay back. Also, Gil Montague, those would have to be decided how that would be handled if you form a six town region. Uh, that could be handled as responsibility, Gil Montague's issue with Medicare and Pioneer's issue on the state aid loan. So those have to be taken care of probably by those member towns before you'd want to put a six town region in. They have to be paid they, back. Pioneer is handling that as, a, as an operating expense. Should they be doing that? They can if they want. Yeah, every year they pay a certain amount back, yes. Okay, so, and Gilmonica is doing that through, uh, let's see. They got a, Joanne okay. can maybe comment on that. Well, Gilmonica is not. Joanne? We have an offset to Medicaid revenue. It's a reduction, yeah. Right. Okay, okay. That clarifies it. That's why they wouldn't be put in because they, they got to be handled separately. What part of these projections is without those. Okay, yeah. number 17. Um, is this from the Education Committee? Yes, it is. We went back and forth on this, to be honest, about whether to include it, but we thought it had important information. But yes, it was from the edu Education Subcommittee, and we stated that it was from them. Um, and then the number 18 is, I think, Alan's observation. And Alan, you're on point here. Um, the, the list do not match exactly. So two points on this. One is the, the section in 32 was to, as an attempt to describe the charts. The section in 91 is not an attempt to describe about the charts. But nonetheless, you're right that there isn't enough of a match there. So earlier today, I went back through and made some edits. I don't think we need to wordsmith this tonight. And I'll send those to, Mar to Max so he can build them in. And there's consistency between the two paragraphs. OK? That'd be perfect. And when you do that, can you also send this document that you guys have nicely put together to Greg so we can have this to go, go through? Sure. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, the, let's see, um, I think this is more of a discussion point for you folks, small combination for a great amount of turmoil. It seems we should be looking at a much larger district. I support this because it could ultimately lead to a larger district. Mike, should we going back to something like tuitioning students into other districts planning board to discuss? So yeah, that's absolutely 
something for you folks to um, to uh, to analyze. Uh, um, number twenty is about the charts. Uh, I think we already talked about this. How does it relate help or is it still available? Yeah. Yeah. All right, in, in appendices 10 and 11, the five-year projections, where did the assumptions come from? Uh, 10 refers to Gil Montague and Joanne and I won DESE simulation workbook. So you have the workbook. Uh, DESE built in more formulas than assum assumptions. So Mike, I would suggest, since we, we, we talked about this earlier, you go through that workbook and then you and I can talk about that. That sounds good. And, and let me let me add to there was, I think something got a little garbled that may have been me um, that I actually meant uh, appendices 10 and 12, one's Gilmanio, one's Pioneer. And I, I did realize that we had discussed that in one of our subcommittee meetings, so. I, yeah, and 12 from Pioneer, like I did with Joanne, I sat down with, I met with. sat down with Tanya. Yeah, with Tanya. Okay. The, um, so 22 does not appear to be a financial advantage to Montague. Maybe Kill Montague could accept children from other towns. B, perhaps a comprehensive tuition plan could be established. Um, again, I think that's more of a discussion point. Um, 23, why is it necessary to have separate buildings for middle and high school? Won't they fit into one building? This was an interesting question. So. Uh, it was our assumption from the um, start of this that um, given the size of these facilities and the fact that both of them are in pretty good shape, um, that one would be a middle school and one would be a high school. So it was our sense that putting, I, I don't have the number of kids off the top of my head, but putting all of the middle and high school kids in one building would be a push, be crowded. Um, Turners Falls, Great Falls is a building that has a lot of square feet. It has 189,000 square feet in that building. Um, but then you get into like what happens to the Pioneer building, which seems like a hard question. Um, so again, our assumption was that one would be middle, one would be high, high school, keep the facilities active. Um, number yeah, 20. And, and Jay, just so you know, when, when the Turners Falls high school was renovated, um, the towns were told that it would have a capacity for 1,200. Okay, yeah, no, it's a big building. Um, we were looking at a facility, uh, Mike, in Berkshire County the other day, um, or a couple of months ago, that's about the same size, and 189,000 square feet is a big facility, yeah. Yeah, Jay, I, I'll just chime in and say that we discussed this early on in the civic leaders, and uh, when we first started the um, to, to look into this and it was sort of agreed upon that if we had to mothball one one building, it would be a, a very, very difficult uh, sell. Right. Yeah. right. Well, it is a difficult sell, but Pioneer's di district has proved it has an appetite to do just that. So there was no regard given to closing Warwick to the effect on, um, on Warwick. And... <clears throat> There was no regard given by the DESE commissioner who um, acquiesced. So I, I really think it should be on the table. Really, happens, some efficiencies Can we say this is a discussion for, for- Warwick later? is rolling with the punches for its stranded asset. And I believe that Pioneer, you know, if that's what's sufficient, one of the things nobody talks about is, 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 here is the cost. And <clears throat> fact of the matter is that the key is getting to an operational sweet spot, I suppose, at least if you want to analyze you know, one district against another in costs. I guess in the end, it really is how much money we're spending. But we're not attending to either of those things here. So... Um, I understand why the consultants didn't take it on and we'll have to. Well, but you, you're, that's absolutely something you can do. Um, <clears throat> number 20. But you see it more as a, uh, a matter of the charge you were given and your understanding of politics. Well, you don't, do you see an issue with us having enough room to do it in that? 
Well, well I, I mean, I think you folks know the, the facilities uh, probably better than we do. Um, if, if Turnus Falls becomes a nine through 12 facility, there will still be excess capacity there. Um, and if Pioneer becomes the middle school, there'll probably also be excess capacity there, maybe to a lesser extent. Um, you're absolutely you know, in bounds as a planning board to talk about other options. But we thought we were asked, first of all, to give a recommendation on this point, okay? So we were asked to say, you know, which one should be a high school and which one should be a middle school. So that's one point. And then, yeah, Dave, I'm, the, um, the, the charge from the start was to think of both facilities staying active. And um, we tried to think about how those facilities are laid out and what they might best accomplish in terms of age groups and programming. But yeah, open it up if you if you want to, and if it if it's more of a focus on costs, then that's something you can talk about. When this is presented to select boards, we may get some input for additions and changes to planning for a better educational experience, potential economies, suggestions. And I have Steve here is commenting on that. Yeah. Well, one of the things when you meet with them that you really want to find out uh, what the feelings are of the of the um, selectmen. And are they talking, what, where do they want to go? Do they want to just save money or do they want to create an educational facility, a robust uh, type of program? Um, if you also need additional help, um, we're hoping if you should, uh, that maybe may, there would be some grant money that you could hire additional uh, consultants to help you with that process. Um, but again, you got it, it's a good idea to go talk to them, get the feeling and find out what people think, but you've also got to try to express to them what does the future look like? And some of the stuff that we put through, especially what Mark did on your um, projections going forward for five or six years. Uh, number 25, what are the gains we want in programs of study and finances and administration in town inputs and responsibilities? I think this is a great question. Um, and it's obviously one that's not gonna get answered tonight, but it, it does um, put some things into focus. What what is it that answers the question about feasibility, really? Um, so um, that's a big issue and uh, one that everybody's got to work on. Um, 26 is, does the report report that larger schools are better schools? And I might ask Paul to chime in on this because this is something we talked a lot about when we were building the program options at the middle school and the high school. And we um, were, um, looking at really small class sizes, looking at courses and programs of studies that didn't have enough kids to run, um, activities that are better with more kids than fewer kids. Um, I think um, our report and, and, and the authors, I think we, to put ownership on it, um, frankly do think that um, schools can get too small um, and we're not advocates of really big schools like, you know, Lawrence or um, Brockton or someplace like that. But I think we do believe that really small schools can be limiting in terms of trying to provide breadth and depth of program. It's also something that, um, that Mike Sullivan talked to us about, about how that's a challenge for, for that, that district. So I don't know if Paul wants to chime in on this. See here. You got mute, Paul. You're on mute. I think there's pros and cons to uh, the the question. I just did some work down in a district down in Connecticut that's about the size of Pioneer. Um, they felt that smallness was a strength, um, you know, for the kids. But on the other hand, they also realized that they couldn't offer as robust a program as they really wanted to because they didn't have the numbers. Uh, so it, it's a matter of flavor for a community. Um, but as Jay said, uh, uh, the more kids in a school um, in terms of programs, the more you can offer. And the more you can offer gives kids more uh, chances and more opportunities. So it's pretty much, a, a, in my opinion, what is a district, what is a district or what does a town or school district want to, want to do? But as Jay said, when a school gets really small, then you, then you are sacrificing programs. And to me, you're beginning to sacrifice the educational opportunities for kids. 
So the last question, number 27, is do smaller districts have to exist in part in this part of the, oh, excuse me, do, do smaller districts have to exist in this part of the state and therefore the state needs to adjust how they support these Western Mass schools? And, you know, obviously this is a policy question. So um, one of the things that Steve mentioned when we were trying to get ready for our conversation with you was uh, the rural aid money. Do you want to talk about that, Steve? Yeah, well, that was one of the things that the rural aid was saying that if you kids are spread out, and how long do you need to have them ride on a bus to get to one place to the other? And then especially if they wanted to, after school activities, trying to get home afterwards. Um, so trying to provide money so they could do that and they could keep those schools. Uh, rural aid is a small amount of money, but it's better than nothing for them. Uh, and they're trying to look at that. Um, so that, that is being, there is a rural aid organization that has been somewhat active. Um, the head of that has, is, is not around as much, um, but it's going to be an issue of coming forward. How are you going to support those? And there is declining of flat enrollments um, uh, heading from here out to the western part of the state to see what they're going to do. Um, Mark, I know, has got to leave at seven and, and he's got a hard leave. Is any, I, I would say, Mr. Chairman, if anybody's any questions for Mark, if they could quickly ask him, then he's got to get going, I know. Uh, before you do, I, I have have a comment on 27. Um, the Student <coughs> Activities Act, I believe one of the acts requires <coughs> a rural small school commission yep. to study rural schools and make recommendations to DESE. I believe it's a June 30 target date. I could be wrong on that. Anybody else want to comment on that? Uh, that is, you're correct, Mark, that's there, but they have not started yet. And I know I talked to Maureen Marshall, president of Mars, and she's been talking to people about it and seeing hopefully they can get going with that, but they haven't yet. Okay. And there are there are designated seats on that commission, right, Steve? There is yes, Mars has, Mars has one of the committee seats. association, the Mars group, um, the superintendent association, mm -hmm. um, and lots of other people, I think teacher unions, et cetera. So that's a good thing. And I think the other maybe last comment I would make, and I think that Alan and Greg know, know this very well, but I'll say it anyway. As you get further into your work, um, you know, it really would be helpful to have your state rep and your state senator um, involved and knowing what you're doing, um, because uh, it, I mean, it touches on this whole thing about hold harmless and what the state, how the state views an attempt to really do something that's rather unprecedented. Okay. Any other input for me? Any, any, any questions? You don't have any Mike? questions for any of us. We could depart. Yeah, can uh, before you depart, uh, I, so I guess you're all set, Mark. Um, Steve, thank you. so thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, thank thanks, you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, just if, if I forget who is who's got the uh, host Mac at this does. point, I'm forgetting. <laughs> Mac, all oh, right, Mac. If you can transfer that back to me, if, if you're done uh, presenting, that'd be great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, so Steve- You know how to do it? He must have done it because I can see everybody. Oh yeah, I got it. Okay, thank you. Um, Brian to everyone. Thank you. Uh, lots. Oh, so Brian had to go, um, but I, I'm glad he participated. Uh, thank you. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So we're going to try to set up a meeting with you and John uh, a little later once uh, uh, with the full report and, and get some I get some thoughts together. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate I appreciate you and Joanne joining. Um, so, uh, Steve, we're going to follow up with the planning board and have a conversation, and then uh, we haven't figured out. We're going to be talking about how we'll be um, rolling this out. Uh, there might be a couple paths uh, the education subcommittee may do one way as they roll it out. Finance may do another, we, or we may do a similar across the board. I'm not sure yet. But, uh, um, at some point, uh, probably would make sense to have, however we do this, in particular if we have a public forum on it, to have some representation of the, the authors. It doesn't have to be all of you, but some presence there. Um, I think that was our initial thought, but 
we, we have to talk about that some more. Okay. Alan, can I just, uh, I do have a question for the consultants yeah. uh, if they have a, a minute. And I, I, I recognize that, um, I mean, this isn't something you were asked to study, but it's been mentioned um, a couple of times this evening. Um, uh, the report discusses the ramifications of combining two school districts. Um, and one of the uh, advantages you know, would be to have more students in the classroom, basically in the school system. Another way to accomplish that would be to have um, one school district accept more students from other towns as tuition students. And I just wonder if you have any experience as to whether um, there are advantages or clear advantages or disadvantages to having a model where you know, everybody's part of you know, one official district where there's a school committee that represents all the towns uh, versus um, you have a district that accepts students from other towns as tuition payers. And I know that both Pioneer and Gilmani, you do accept students from other towns as tuition paper payers. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a much smaller scale. It seems to work for those districts. And so I'm just, I'm curious, since you have a lot more experience than, than we do, uh, if that's ever been on your radar screen and if you have any thoughts. Mike, I could, I could say a couple of things about that. So um, I spent nine years as a superintendent of a supervisory union in Berkshire, Northern Berkshire County, very rural area. And um, it, there were four towns involved and one of the towns was non-operating. None of the towns operated a middle school or a high school, okay? So with the non-operating town, all of the kids that they sent, no matter where they went, were tuition kids. And with the other three towns, all of their secondary school students, we paid tuition to neighboring middle school, mostly high schools, neighboring high schools. Um, and um, so it's, you know, in one sense, it's efficient because you don't have to build a high school, you don't have a high school principal and teachers, et cetera, et cetera. But another thing that goes with it is you have no leverage on what the tuition rate is, okay? So um, I would call up a neighboring district and say, how much is it gonna cost? The, uh, what's the tuition rate gonna be? Uh, we gotta send 25 kids to such and such a high school our tuition rate would bounce around according to what kind of revenue the receiving district needed. And you still have transportation and you still need a SPED director. So um, you can, it's, it's not a bad model in really rural parts of the state because it, these, school, these towns, I can name them if you want, Florida, Clarksburg, Savoy, um, they, they should not have high schools. Um, and that was the most efficient way for them to do it. But um, there is no, you don't have much bargaining power in terms of what it costs to send your kids places. And you don't have a whole lot of oversight in terms of the education um, and the programs that are there for them either. Um, but it can work in, in that setting. Uh, on a, I, I don't know if I'd have to, you know, think some more on it, but that's the only direct experience I have with tuition arrangements. Um, and I remember sometimes being frustrated when the receiving district would decide that their budget was in a bind and our tuition rate went up by 15%. And, and it's like, you have to pay it. So yeah, um, that's- Jay, I, I can, yeah, I, I had a similar experience when I was at Mount Greylock Union 69 because uh, New Ashford was non-operating right. at any rate. The bottom line there of those four communities, um, and there was Hancock and, and uh, Richmond, well, they had a choice of three high schools that they would tuition their kids in. So there was at least a little bit of competition, whether they went to Taconic or, or Pittsfield High. Um, but you're right, uh, there's, you know, they, they sort of put the number down. And I used to think they got together and decide, well, what are you going to be asking for tuition? So it, it kept it a little competitive, but... Uh, <laughs> I, I never knew that was always the wild card. And that was always the blame when I went to town meeting and said, well, here's, here's the number, you know, that we have to pay for our high school kids. <laughs> right. I think Paul had, did Paul want to say something here? I ran one of those districts in Connecticut 
uh, one school, K to eight, tuitioned our kids off to, uh, when I got there, several high schools, which to me was very, very um, difficult. So uh, Connecticut has a rule that you can uh, designate your high school. So we had the school board designate the one high school. Um, but uh, oh, five years before I, I got to that district, uh, one of the one of the high schools ran into difficulty, one of the towns, and they raised the tuition in the middle of the school year. And boy, what did that cause problems? So um, I see Alan shaking his head. Uh, so <laughs> it is a difficult thing to do. In one case, like Jay said, it hey, less headaches. You don't have to worry about a high school. But on the other hand, um, you just you just waited every year at budget time to see how much your your high school tuition was going to go up, and you had no control. Just absolutely no control. Yeah. Well, and I, I guess, thank you. I, I appreciate these comments. I mean, I'll just uh, offer that, I mean, Montague's, um, I mean, all our towns are members of the Franklin County Technical School District, which is 19 towns. And I can tell you that I don't think any particular town feels that it has a lot of control over that. Right. Um, we get told what we pay every year. And if enough towns get together and want to object, it can work. But I think it's got to be uh, more than a third of the towns to do that hasn't happened in my memory. So, you know, part of where I'm coming from is wondering if you go, you know, the, the, the more towns you start including in a district, it seems to be inevitable that the less actual control any particular town actually has over what's happening. You are right though, Mike, if enough sending districts get together, um, what you find is that the receiving district really need you. So they right. will, they really will respond. Um, so we actually had worked on an agreement where at some rolling averages in terms of tuition. We, uh, it it we, seems like the, the, the agreement could go a long way no, towards helping to right. ameliorate those problems, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Good question. Well, it's something we can uh, talk about some more and explore. Greg, uh, we're coming on that bewitching hour for you as well. I know you have to, yeah, you'll I'm be going okay. soon. I'm okay for now. I think Joanne, Joanne had a comment. Yeah. Oh, I just, I'm sorry. I didn't see. That's okay. I just wanted to say that we have a tuition agreement with Irving. And so while the rate may change a little bit, it fluctuates. It, it's also dependent on the number of students they have, but we have that agreement. And so we can't change it in the middle of the year. But the one thing that a sending district doesn't have when they're tuitioning students into a different district is they don't get transportation reimbursement. So that's a big cost for districts. Um, you know, if they have to send two buses or three buses, the town of Irving sends three buses to the high school, they don't get transportation reimbursement for those buses. Right. And that could be 70, 75, 80% of the cost of those buses. So that's a huge dollar amount that they're not getting the benefit of by not being a member. Because they're not a yeah, regional good, district. Right. Yeah. yeah, good point, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Alan? Yep. Great. Can I just say, I, just, I wanna follow up to, with David again, just so that I can clarify the context of uh, where that came from in terms of uh, the building. Uh, when we were a civic leaders group and not, uh, in the midst of forming a planning board. Uh, really what the conversation was around was if we're going to form a planning board, I think it was gonna be a non-starter if we were gonna to go to our select boards and say, we're gonna mothball, you know, let's say Pioneer and, 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 and you know, bus everybody over to, to Gil Montague. Uh, I think that's where the, that conversation started because we wanted to get the planning board off the ground. And if it became a uh, conversation around which building you were going to close, that we were uh, we were concerned that we wouldn't get this uh, planning board off the ground at all. So it's not that we can't talk about it. It's not that it's not even uh, something we can put on the table. I just wanted to clear that up, and I I completely understand where you're coming from, and uh, you know the emotions behind it. Alan, if we're all set, we'll leave you to your planning planning board. All right, thank you very much, um, gentlemen. That was uh, very, very helpful. Um, okay. you, you did a good job responding. And I'm looking forward to getting a hard copy of that so I can print it out and um, go back, listen to the tape, and take some more notes about uh, the responses. So I appreciate it. I Anyone else have any questions? 
Alan, Anyone else have any questions? Uh, Matt. I, I just want you to know that I've enjoyed looking at this poster of Alfred E. Newman for president tonight here. <laughs> yes. Don't even go there, Bill. <laughs> Okay, well, have a good, good meeting, everybody. Have a good meeting. Good, good night. Bye. 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 Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bill, I, did you raise?